Thousands of people will be illumined in course of time. This will save mankind. This is the only, this is the only way open to, to survive. I want to still try to define a little bit more how yeah. one goes to get enlightened or this process. You said one of the processes which helps is to keep the thought of the divine behind one. Yes. Is this somewhat similar which drives men to climb the highest peaks in the world? When you speak of this urge, the urge toward enlightenment, the urge toward awakening, isn't this urge expressed in many ways, isn't this the same thing that we sometimes call curiosity or pioneering spirit? The man who must make it to the top of Mount Everest because it's there. Even in my reply to Sir Julian Huxley, the urge that draws a scientist to know the secrets of nature or a diver to explore the depths of an ocean or a mystic to know himself is the same. It is the same Kundalini, the evolutionary energy in man. I can say it emphatically. So you're saying in a sense that cu the curiosity is a function of Kundalini? Now, you are right in a sense. You see, curiosity is possessed by animals even. In the case of man, this curiosity develops. It's strongest in children. Yes, because they, they are developing. They have an active Kundalini in them at that age even. Now this curiosity, scientific curiosity or curiosity, <laughs> to, this coupled with a desire to probe, to investigate, to reach, to acquire, to attain, not to attain wealth or power, but to attain something in which man has to show his best, maybe of his intellect or his physical condition, something, some ideal in which he has to excel. Well, that is the outcome of a Kundalini working in our system. I have another question on the same path. I don't know if you've listened to the tape of Bill Strobing. The, the, the t tape recording we brought you of the man from... Yes, you see, unfortunately, the, the, the battery... Oh, I have some here. We'll give you some tomorrow. Think, think like that. I have that. Uh, it we needs only three. All right. We'll, because I think it is important for us... All right. ...to ask you about this tape. All right. I, we shall put it tomorrow and then... We it's can. a very short take. Mm, good. Uh, I didn't like to go back again. The question we started yesterday to probe, and that is about intelligence. You see the intelligence everywhere, and this comes. Does this come somewhat out of your Hindu background? That it is like a Brahman or something like this? It is nothing of the sort. You see, if it were unattended by a visible sign. I mean a tangible sign, I would feel that I am either deluded or deceived because it has brought me nothing. In fact, I have been questioning like this for a number of years. But when I see this intelligence, for instance, sometimes I have a problem in my mind and suddenly I am offered a solution. It doesn't come through my mind. I just grasp it. It is glimpse of this intelligent and consciousness, our human values completely vanish. Is there any constancy at all between our real world and that world of the all? My friend, no. everything that you do comes from that. I, I think you say constancy. No, no, what I meant is, which I understand, I mean, you can describe that feeling of the intelligence, of its past, its present, its future. Those dimensions don't apply. Are there any dimensions which I know in this world which would apply? This is a very relevant question. Now you seize the dimension of human consciousness and come to other dimension where all we know of the world is inadequate and totally incompatible to express what we feel there. All right, now 
let me make a transformation in math. Say, I have a straight line here. In that world, that all, it's a curve. The only thing I know is that there's a straight line here, and there there's a straight line. Everything else... I would, I would give you an, uh, an illustration of what has been said even by ancient mystics. Now, let us take this position that we have a whole ocean of a substance which is capable of swallowing a man entirely with all his thoughts, feelings, sense of time and distance, of straightness and crooked, of beginning and end, and to put him in a state of awareness which makes use of none of these concepts. There, there's a, a difficult point that arises out of what you say, and that is when you get into a state of awareness whereby you look upon all things on earth in some sense in their cosmic proportions, then isn't it very hard to see momentary right and wrong as very important? Couldn't you get very detached you see, and see this always happens. The enlightened man develops a certain sense of detachment and indifference. As I told you just now, that would be no problem, it would be a passage. In fact, it is only perhaps then that one gets the real perspective of what a, what a man is and of the world. But from that perspective, one would not want to guide a society, because the society must be obeying these local sanctions of right and wrong and ethical behavior. And if you get very detached about it, uh, you could see all kinds of things happening and not have, the, have any urge to do anything about it. Yes, there is an urge that the experience should be shared by others. Is this true of all mystics? Because we know of some people in the West who would have claimed to have seen that all, that intelligence, experienced it, and then were so much in that intelligence or that feeling that they, they, they kept so separated that they no longer want to concern themselves in a way of writing the world. Now, look at history. All those who had the genuine experience made every sacrifice for mankind and even courted death all right now. This was July 4th. At this point, there was a brief break for tea, which in Kashmir and in most all of India, for that matter, is as much of a tradition as it is in England. When the conversation was resumed, the tape recorder was inadvertently left off, however. Several minutes went by before it was switched on, so when we join the discussion, it is almost in mid-sentence. They had been talking about the role of the guru. Gopi Krishna had not had the benefit of a teacher or guru when he awakened Kundalini. This was not by choice, but due mainly to the circumstances surrounding his life. He worked long hours each day at a regular job as a clerk in the government of the state of Kashmir. Each morning, before going to the office, he would practice a simple form of meditation in which intense concentration was the most distinguishing feature. Though he suffered greatly after the awakening, because of his lack of knowledge and training, he has come to the conclusion that the knowledge should be made widely known and that when safe methods of arousing Kundalini are devised by science, they should be taught in schools, part of the regular curriculum, in order to improve mental health. 